My name's Marcus, and welcome to Recess. Today, we're co-hosting this lecture with Education Alchemists. That's because we're joined by their principal consultant, Professor Jilly Salmon. Jilly is a world-renowned thinker, researcher, and practitioner in all things learning futures. She presents and writes blogs on pedagogical transformation and innovation. She has over 33 years of experience of transforming higher education in both Australia and the United Kingdom. Today, Julie is here to talk to us about five very important steps. Thank you, Julie. Oh, thanks for that introduction, Marcus. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to tell you about five key concepts to help you with the digital aspects of your learning and teaching. So I'm going to talk about these five. First of all, a key idea as we move towards creating the future through our learning is to design it in advance of the students arriving and then focus on the delivery many times. It's the best scalable way of doing it. Secondly, you do need to make good design choices. I think over the pandemic, many people got confused about the differences between synchronous and asynchronous of location-based and online. So I've put together four for you to consider. And then the idea of scaffolding for achievement. When we talk about student-centeredness, what we really need to do is to walk in the student's shoes and actually be able to walk through the scaffold so that they can actually see not only where they're going, um, but where they've been for some metacognition as well. Number four is probably what people ask me most of all is, well, it's all very well, but how do I get them to engage? So I'm going to be mentioning how to do that. And then lastly, when we teach online with a new design, we do really need a few skills. So we don't spend a huge amount of our time on it and we are effective. So here we go on all of those five, just to say it is of course a complex adaptive system. So they do actually move around with each other, but if you can't tackle them all at once, at least choose one out of what I'm suggesting and then get started on the others. But it, is, it does shift quite quickly. Most of my work goes back um, more than 25 years. It may surprise some of you that there are professors of uh, digital learning. There are journals. We've been researching this for a long time. So I'm not going to uh, subject you to all of that before, though there will be some references if you'd like to see the evidence. But what I will be doing is telling you how the concepts can be modelled and you can adopt them very quickly and right away. So here we go. So first of all, before you do anything, before any transformation, doing anything every, even slightly differently, you really do need to have a vision of where you're going. Um, so you do really need to work together make sure that you've got not only really fantastic learning outcomes that are relevant for the industrial revolution 4.0 for all the things we hope for for our students to contribute in the future um, but also that you've got a little bit of disruption for yourself um, and that is the kindest thing to do to yourself at this point before you start laying anything out or making any choices and then you will be designing once and be able to just make small adjustments evolve over time. And then making good design choices, as I said, there's a lot that you can do on this. So first of all, familiarity with location and by location, I mean both campus um, and in situ. And um, I've put pros and cons here. I'm not going to go through them all in this video, but you can have a look and the references will help you to understand them. 
But each one of these four modes of learning I'm going to show you really does have pros and cons. And you need to know what they are before you're going to say, oh, I'm not going to have any digital or I'm going to be 100 percent online or, oh, we'll do hybrid, we'll do blend. Um, you need to know a little bit more about them. Blend, a lot of people think it's the best of both words, but it is actually less equitable for some, especially if it's be expecting people to turn up on campus. Big benefit of combining asynchronous and synchronous learning is that, God forbid, we get another pandemic or people can't come to campus or to the workplace for some reason, then they will at least um, be able to have synchronicity built in, but doing it digitally. Um, number four, three is hybrid. A lot of you tried hybrid teaching, I'm sure, during the pandemic. Um, and it still has some good choices for students. So if they can't travel to a place um, and it gives them good choices, you can use existing resources but it actually is, has quite a few disadvantages, usually for the people who are remote. Our natural thing is to focus on those who are in front of us. So what we're working on with hybrid now is to have bridge building people, event managers, if you like, to make sure everyone's included. Um, and fully digital. Um, a huge number of advantages. Obviously, you can reach out and get a very much larger student body, and that has diversity in it, which needs to be designed into your teaching. It's popular with employers. You can often break things up into chunks and have some micro credentials. It's really good for learning analytics, but it does really need a specialist redesign. It doesn't work if you try and transfer your campus-based teaching to online. You also need people who understand the delivery. I call them e-moderators in my terms, but they're the tutors, the teaching assistants, who are the face for the students throughout the delivery of the learning. And if you, you really need to recruit for volume, people usually ask me, well, how many students makes it worth it? <clears throat> At least 100, ideally a lot more. And that means marketing is expensive to reach those numbers. Um, so that was number uh, two, actually, for uh, the modes of learning. Um, so when you look back, there's a couple of absolute key concepts that will be helpful to you. The first one is take a look at the five stage model. It was originally developed in the Open University with large numbers of MBA students in the early days of working online and remotely. Um, it was a grounded model, so it should feel fairly easy to use. Um, and it starts off with giving access and motivation. Secondly, socialization and group formation. Thirdly, cooperation. At stage three, students are usually still in pursuit of their own goals, but are starting to see the benefits of working with others and only then go on to collaboration and knowledge construction. And number five is also helpful, metacognition. You can give huge benefits when you're working online for getting people to look back to see not only what they've learned, but how they've learned, which will stand them in very good stead as mature learners for the future. Um, so when you're actually building this into your teaching, these are the kind of things that you need to consider. I'm going to say a bit more about all of those now. With all the modes of learning, there's six key elements. These are what they are. There's the pacing, the calendar time, um, the amount of time it takes for any activity, um, and also the amount of student study time. And it needs to be very carefully managed. This makes the biggest difference for students' retention and success, that you make it viable, essentially, in terms of laying it out and taking them through a process. Knowledge and skills. <clears throat> we know it's really, really motivating for students to understand how both their knowledge and their skills will be used in, in their future careers and their contribution to the world. So that needs to be made very explicit 
So everything we design is purposeful and we make it clear to the students that it's purposeful. Online feedback and assessment, and this applies whether it's blended or entirely digital, is really important. A lot more feedback. Um, so don't be afraid of doing quizzes, of having peer feedback. All the things you can do digitally doesn't all have to be from you. And then this clear difference between synchronous all at the same time activity, which may or may not be all at the same location, and asynchronous activity, which gives a completely different way of looking at things. I'm going to show you a model for that in a minute. And then don't forget the independent study. Give them thinking time, give them breathing time. That's what makes a difference in the pacing. So you do need to put all of this together. What I use is storyboarding, be more Disney. Um, if you look on YouTube, you'll see some wonderful ways that Disney did it in the early days of animated movies. And it's still done that way for Netflix and everything else these days. We need to do it for our teaching. So we lay this out. So we've got the topics, the assessment, the synchronous activity, the asynchronous activity, and the independent work. And then we can walk through it to see how well it works. Um, just to let you know that to go with the activities framework, there's also a way of incorporating um, all of these things into one key piece of work, not student to computer, but students in groups. And you can start to put them in right from the beginning of your storyboard. I'm going to very briefly show you the framework, um, and, but there is lots of other ways that you can follow it up. I write books about it. It's on my website, write blogs and so on. Um, must be purposeful. Everything you ask them to do as activity aligns with assessment and feedback. One set of instructions, one message and very clear timing. I know I'm pushing the timing, but it is important, the research shows. And then what you do is give them a spark to start the activity, not read all of this book or do all of this activity, but just something that entices them in. And then this is important, make sure that each student contributes an individual um, response to the spark before you go into them working together. And then you should, if you can design these activities right, just come in to give the summary and the feedback at the end. And that's really important that you do that. But you should not need to keep going in all the way through the activity going on. And if you go back and have a look at what it looks on the storyboard, um, you'll see that you can have an activity every week or they can go over a couple of weeks. So if you do the design in advance, it's pretty efficient for you then to be able to go forward. So there's the activities framework. If you're interested in using it, I suggest you look it up. Um, and then the actual delivery, having done all the work in advance, it is slightly different teaching in this situation. Your videos will probably be already up there. Um, so your role is a bit different. And I think it's this. I think it's uh, kind of breaking the fourth wall between you and the students. And if you're working in performing arts or go to the theatre a lot, we'll know a lot about this, this fourth wall. It involves briefly, directly to, or acknowledging or engaging the audience. You know, it's that kind of odd thing that sometimes in, you know, where you're watching on the telly even, that the actor will turn and speak to you as the audience. And so it's kind of a new meaning of presence, not that you have to be physically there, but you are super aware of the audience that you're engaging and the feedback that you're giving to them at the time. Um, this is some research that's only just been completed. Um, I don't know whether you'll be able to see it too well, but essentially the green bit is what a lot of tutors and academics have told me they have needed to learn and practice before they've moved online for the delivery part. Um, so I'll put a link to it in the information associated with this video um, so that you can see that it is beneficial to learn some new skills. Um, and weaving and summarizing of activities 
is one of the key ways to benefit the design work that you've done. <laughs> so that's it from me. I hope you, you like those five things um, that will help you. Very, very best wishes for your work in the future. Back to you, Marcus. Thanks, Julie. That's a really deep insight into how someone can start uh, developing an online course, but also more than that, I think a lot of those rules were work so well for online, but also face to face. I think the pacing is something that has become prominent in online education, but it's something that we quite often forget when, when we're face to face. I remember when my days as a teacher, how quickly time would fly by in the classroom and then you'd have five minutes to have the conclusion when you'd plan for 15. So I think a lot of what you're speaking there is gospel and I, I very much appreciate uh, your time today. My question that I have for you, and I think um, when we were speaking uh, off offline before you mentioned you had seven thousand MBA students at one at one moment. Um, now that's a lot of students, uh, a lot of students online, and I wonder how did you, or not specifically for those seven thousand students, but how would you create a community online? Because we see that as something quite important that students may miss out on uh, when they are just up behind the computer screens as opposed to in the classroom together is yes how would you best create community within your students okay well that's what the five stage model is intended to do um and um it is intended to have a focus on generally to start with small numbers of students working together which can then have the snowball effect um you can relate it to what you would do with groups in class, but it has a different feel to it. But you wouldn't expect, you know, to get uh, full communication between hundreds of students in a lecture theatre. However, you would start with smaller groups and then you snowball up to, to bigger groups. Um, it needs to be purposeful. I mean, if you're working perhaps, you know, with management students and others, they, they would see the value of understanding different contexts, um, and applications, but in fact, it applies just as much across all the disciplines. I mean, we know, for example, that research does best if it's collaborative, um, but it does need to be highly structured to work in the online environment. It just won't happen by chance. Um, so it's probably the thing that people ask me the most, how do you do this? In fact, you need to develop the skills of doing it on a small scale before you need to take it up to a large scale. So we generally um, um, have our students in groups of six. Um, there's something a bit magical about the plus or minus is that you get with six. It's, it's viable for a small group, but it's also quite scalable up to probably um, three or four times that number um, to present to each other. Um, and that's going back to the pacing. Any more than that? and then people are sitting passively for long periods of time. So it's a numbers game, actually. Really appreciate that, yep. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time, Julie. It's really, really appreciated. And I'm sure all of the academics and staff watching this will take away a lot of useful information when moving to either online hybrid or even just face-to-face -face learning. <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, bye everyone. Thanks a lot, Marcus. Mm -hmm.